This is a project to find our voices. That's why it's called the Public Voice Salon. Um, we're, we're a new beginning. Uh, we hope that this grows and that other people across the country in small towns and in big cities can realize that they have the power to come together and talk about what's real and what matters and, and try to figure out ways to make this country a better place. Uh, and we're doing it in the style of the old-fashioned salons of yore so that uh, culture and art is also mixing in. Um, and uh, so basically that's who we are. And uh, my name is John Braden. I'm a teacher at CUNY. Uh, I teach English at the City University of New York. Uh, the inspiration for this came originally from my teaching in my classrooms and trying to empower my students to find their voices and realizing that many citizens throughout our, our society are being silenced right now by a corporate controlled media and by corporate controlled politics. So this is a rare space of freedom for you to say what's on your mind, what you really think and feel, and uh, then we'll get a discussion going. And through the dialogue itself, we'll learn and we'll grow and we'll have epiphanies and we'll, we'll be different people when this is over. Uh, my name's Corinne Mullen. Um, I'm a partner in a law firm, the Mullen Law Firm here in Hoboken. We've been here for 20 years. Um, I come from a background um, out of NBC News and I left that to become a lawyer here. And what I'm here to talk about tonight um, are some of the issues that New Jersey residents and uh, residents around the country are facing in the area of foreclosure. Uh, I'm a foreclosure mediator and also an advocate for people who are currently having their homes foreclosed. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Richard Margolin. I've been living in Hoboken, I guess it's about 20 years now. Uh, at present, I'm an uh, independent financial services broker. Uh, I'm also, I also help run and operate a, um, a uh, spiritual organization in, in Manhattan, which has one of the distinctions of having the longest running uh, food service program in, in the city. It's about it's uh, about 35 years now. I prefer for it to go nameless, but uh, that's pretty much my, my focus as well as politics and culture. So. Uh, my name is Ethan Chazen, and what intrigued me about this group discussion tonight was addressing issues that the main street, mainstream media is not uh, shedding the light of day on. I am a career coach and I help people find their dream jobs and the issue I hope that we all could maybe talk a little bit about tonight is the fact that the job market has changed. Fundamentally the old ways of finding your dream job don't apply um, and I'm here to hopefully shed some light on how you would go about finding a job given the fact that there aren't a whole lot uh, of opportunities that are available in today's workplace. Hi, um, I'm Liz Adams. Uh, I'm a singer and actor by profession. <clears throat> I've lived here in Hoboken um, as of mid-April for five and a half years. And um, these sorts of things interest me. Um, I like to express myself, obviously. That's my profession of choice. Um, and I like speaking about these sorts of issues, sociocultural, political, um, artistic, spiritual. Those are my main focuses. Thanks. Hi, my name is Joe Del Pryor, and I am retired. Uh, I'm a writer, painter, photographer. Um, I recently published my first book, and the writing of the book was much easier than the marketing, going out and doing author signings and appearances and open mics. So uh, I'm learning little by little what it's like to be self-published in a world where um, big publishers and uh, big conglomerates pretty much control the publishing industry. So it's been an interesting experience and uh, it's only two weeks old, so we'll see what happens over the next five, six months. Hello, my name is uh, Maria Rivera. I've been living in Hoboken for about seven years now. I was originally from the Philippines and I came over here when I was uh, 22 years old and uh, I'm already 44, so half of my life I've lived in my home country and half of my life I've lived here. So I think one of the topics I would like to talk at length is immigration and also 
Um, unfortunately, I'm unemployed right now, but I'm enjoying the, my so-called summer vacation. So now that I see that there's a career coach here, I'll talk to him after the show. <laughs> so thank you. My name is Asa Milbanks. I'm a singer and songwriter. And I came here because I'm intrigued by the idea of uh, breaking through the increased corporate media and having an opportunity to speak outside of that. So I'm really, really happy uh, that people have come here tonight. Uh, my name is John Braden, as I said earlier, and I'm the founder of this TV show, The Public Voice Salon, which is a dialogue that, uh, I mean, I didn't invent this concept of dialogue. I'm just sort of, it's been around a long time. It goes all the way back to our ancient ancestors who sat around campfires and caves and talked about what's important, you know. But I think we are getting away from it in our culture now. And, you know, I think computers are good, but I think at the same time that they, they do create opportunities to connect, but they also you know, keep us away from each other. We're on Facebook instead of face-to-face. -face. So I think we, we're creating a kind of a dynamic here where people can relearn the art of, and the joy of conversation, uh, telling stories to each other. We learn, this is how we learn, where human beings learn. And I also think about the problems in our world today and the crises that are happening uh, and the fact that more people aren't out there protesting, for example, that both political parties now are dominated by the corporate, corporate sector. And, and the earlier decision of Citizens United this year and the Supreme Court gave carte blanche to the corporations to control. So we're living in a corporatocracy now and nobody's doing anything about it. The media is controlled by, by the corporations. And I think when people get together and start talking about this though, I think big changes can happen from a small group of people just getting back eye to eye, saying the, pro the problems need to be named first. And I think this is very powerful what we're doing, which we're simply naming the problems. And many people are afraid to name the problems because they've never had the opportunity to do that, to speak truth to power. Because we watch television and we feel like, oh, you know, the, 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 they're the experts, they must know. You know, you watch Meet the Press and you watch Sunday Morning and all the talk shows. You know, but well, look at what they're, look at what the, you know, the kind of people that they're actually supporting, which is very bad people doing very bad things in our world. So anybody who's afraid to talk on television, however tremblingly, you know, you should speak your truths and come here, come to the Public Voice Salon, anybody who's at home watching. My goal for this is to get this across the country, to have this as a nationwide television program. Uh, and uh, so other people can get a model for how citizens can gather and have this kind of dialogue. So anyway, with that being said, again, I don't want to dominate the conversation. I want this to be dialogic. I want people to be able to say what's on your mind. And also, if you brought some art to share, since this is a salon, and if you have a song to sing, if you have a poem to read, this is a great opportunity also, or an essay, or a piece of an essay. This is an artistic endeavor. So one of the sort of default topics is creativity. And how can we grow as creative beings? And I think there is a linkage between political growth and creative growth as well. If we can, we can improve our agency, this is a very big word for me as an educator, and it's kind of one of these fancy words in education circles, agency. It means the ability to really break through and to, to make choices and to act on your choices and to move through the world, to be an actor in your own life. And many of us are feeling a sense of paralysis today, a, a state of numbness. Uh, and and uh, works of art can help us break through that. You know, whether it's a film or a painting, you know, or a song, you, the, the work of art, if you grapple with it, if you get meaning from it, it can inspire you, it can open up spaces, it can name problems, it could also uh, very much articulate a world that might be. And part of our job here today is to talk about what is the kind of world we want to live in. You know, we're not home watching Hannity tonight. You know, so we get a, we get a chance to talk about the world we want to live in now, right? So, with that being said, again, I'm very happy to be here. I'm excited that this is growing this project, and I just found out that New York City is going to be broadcasting it. So we've only been, thank you very much, we've only been on the air for a month and a half in Hudson County, and already New York has picked us up. So, and uh, and if we just want to sit with the silence a little bit, that's okay too, because I think, you know, we have to learn how to shatter these silences. And a lot of these silences are from corporate media and living in a corporate autocracy where people have forgotten how to find their voice, 
or you know so let's just sit with the silence until somebody has something to say okay thank you um in the capacity that I serve as a career coach, you're auto automatically a, a therapist and a counselor and a coach and an advocate. And one of the first things I do when I work with people who are looking either to change jobs, change careers, re-enter the workforce, it's the notion of, well, they've already had most of what makes them uniquely individual um, torn away. So I think it's an interesting, this notion, and I wrote a book about bulletproof your career in turbulent times, building yourself back up as a brand almost. But the first part is identifying what you want to be in this next leg of your journey. And it almost has a very Asian or philosophical approach. So I'd be keen on knowing when you write a, a, a song, what the process is you go through. When you do a job search, you go through this process. So you defend as an advocate a group of people who the government is basically taking them out of house and home what that means. It's all symbolic. And I came to this spending my whole career working for big companies that I just loathe. So. Thanks. Picking up on what you said about the Citizens United decision, we, we are living in a society where we have increased corporate control of everything. Coming up to the, um, the 2012 elections, we're going to have totally unfettered corporate control of elections, no limits on the amount of money they can spend to support a candidate. And um, it's very it's very scary, and, and as you said, there's a sense of paralysis many people have in their lives. <clears throat> by, um, and by being able to, um, by being able to just discuss these issues, certainly empowering, uh, at the same time, it's, um, it's a bit like it's a bit like ice skating, ice skating uphill, you know. It's a uh, it's a situation where if if people want to take an interest on what's going on around them, in their communities and in the country, there has to be a sea change. You have shows like Hannity, like you mentioned, mainstream media that prey on people's worst instincts. They prey on people's um, their fears, their reptilian brain. And it's nice. Um, well, it's nice to see see someone trying to do something, something else, something different from that. Um, but it's very disturbing that that we had that decision, that we had the Supreme Court going in that direction, further in that direction now. So that I had nothing to add to that. <laughs> Um, I guess what you said uh, really struck a, struck, I'm sorry, uh, struck a chord about this notion of paralysis. Uh, what I am so interested in and actually so angry about is the paralysis that's really been created in um, some of the homeowners thinking that they have no ability to fight the bank that gave them the mortgage in the first place. I mean, you know, we're, we're facing a situation where an unprecedented amount of Americans find themselves with their homes underwater, uh, they're in foreclosure, and the very same mortgage brokers who sold them the mortgage in the first place now say, I never would have written that for you. So here in Hudson County and uh, across the nation, what the, the message that I would like to get out is that the last thing you want to do is go to the bank with, the, with your hat in your hand and beg them to modify your mortgage. Um, you should take them directly on, assert predatory lending against them, and fight them, because it is only through doing that that you're actually going to get somewhere. I hear in New Jersey I'm a mortgage mediator, and that program has been only partially successful. Maybe only 20 percent of the mortgages have been refinanced. And we're just trying to inspire people to action, to do something if you're in foreclosure. Um, and it's a it's an issue I'm very very passionate about because so many people are losing their homes. A small number of people um, are making a lot of money in America at the expense of the great many, and I think this financial crisis was just a part of that. Uh, when these finance 
people start talking all their gobbledygook and you don't even know what they're talking about, I get nervous. You know, it's really, it's really a travesty. And um, uh, Robert Reich, who was the Treasury Secretary under Bill Clinton, has repented and seen the light. And he has an essay in The Nation magazine this week about wealth inequality, where he looks at the wealth inequality, there were twin, two peaks of wealth inequality in the 20th century. The first peak came just before the Great Depression, where the top 1% took in 28% of the, of the wealth. When Roosevelt came in with the New Deal and policies that were more equitable and a progressive tax structure, that brought down the, the take of the top 1% to 10% from 28% down to 10% through the 1950s and 60s, which was the golden age of the American middle class. When Ronald Reagan came in, he began to reverse the tax structure to benefit the tiny elite and brought it back up to, just before the market tanked in, in 2008, it was back to 29%. So you had, there, there is Robert Reich, he connects the dots in this new essay that's in the Nation magazine. If you get a chance to read it, it's really, and again, why, what I say when I have a chance to talk to the media and the public out there is there ought to be people in the streets, there ought to be protesting about this, there ought to be millions of people in the streets, day after day and week after week, until we change this structure, until we get a Democratic Party that's a real Democratic Party, or if we have to go to the Green Party, or if we have to create a third party, a non-corporate sponsored party, I think it's about, it's about politics and we need to take our country back because Noam Chomsky says it's going in a fascist direction. And when Noam Chomsky talks, I pay attention because he's a pretty smart dude. Okay, yes. I just have like a follow-up question for her if she doesn't mind answering it. Um, I see a lot of like ads about um, helping out people with their foreclosure and all that. What do you think about that? And I think it it's also um, we should re uh, we should really like encourage everybody that we know that face foreclosure that that it's all up to them too to like go to the bank, deal with the bank and all that stuff. But do these companies that tout that ad? really help them or are they just a third party out for and all those greedy people you know what I mean so um, they are a complete and utter fraud every one of them what they want to do is they want to assume your mortgage or, or refinance for you and hold the mortgage in the hopes that you default again which you will and then they will own your home they, all those 800 numbers, all those postings on telephone polls are just a complete fraud. Ignore them. And so many people who are desperate seek those people out and, and they are absolute thieves. So, so, so we have this, what you're talking about, is people can't afford to stay in their homes. We have the unemployment rate in this country. I don't know if you heard, there's this thing called the unemployment rate in this country, and we've been lied to for years, that the official is grossly understating what's going on. So you have these people, 15 to 20 percent, the number is more realistically, are unemployed in this country, so almost one in five Americans are out of work, have given up looking for work, and oh, by the way, they may own a home. So that's a problem. The second is one in four Americans are what's called contract workers now, meaning one in four people in this country who work cannot find jobs, so they're being forced to be a entrepreneur or solo practitioner. No health insurance, no benefits, no startup money, don't go to the government for money. They have this thing called the SBA, the Small Business Administration. They lie to small business owners. So there's no way to get out of this vicious cycle. So you talk about ice skating up a hill. Um, how do you get out from under when you're destitute, you lose your home, you don't have a job, you don't have prospects, and oh, by the way, all the safety mechanisms that we used to have, like after World War II, the GI Bill, they don't exist. What do you do? Oh, I know, go recreate yourself. Reinvent yourself. Yeah. Um, one interesting fact that comes up is that when these comp companies streamline, when they outsource jobs, when they lay off people, in the short run, yeah, their shareholders may make a profit because the company's expenses have been cut. But in the long run, 
the fewer people you have paying taxes in a town or paying much less taxes because they're unemployed or downsized and making a lot less money, that town still needs money to run. So the town has to raise its tax rates. And guess who gets hit with the raise? The very people at the top of the ladder. So they may make a profit on this end, but they're going to get hit on the other end with higher taxes. And um, it kind of evens out, I think. So uh, you have all these unemployed people, 8 million. Obama said we've gotten back 650,000 jobs. He recognizes that is just drop in the bucket and it may be more than eight million so all of these people are not paying taxes or they're paying much less taxes than they were so you have less services and the tax rates have to go up and the people at the top end get hit with more tax increases um you joe you said something there that um you said the really rich get the get the tax increases I think just the middle middle class get the tax increases and the top 1% get the get the sweet little tax loopholes. But you know, you were saying something there, um, Mr. Braden. Um, you know, uh, Richard and I attended a, a spiritual event really in the city. And um, <clears throat> it, it's, it's, I consider her to be like, I call her one of the world mothers. Amma is her name. But anyway, really just a very cool lady. She came a little earlier than she usually does every year. To, she comes to Manhattan Center, but uh, she came a little earlier this year. But anyway, <clears throat> they give out, and it's all free. I mean, you know, you can go in there and you meet her one-on-one. -on -one. Each person gets a turn with her, which is really cool. But anyway, they were giving out these booklets and explaining her mission, and she, she's not all, she does a t her tour not only all, all over the country, but all over the world. And <clears throat> what struck me in this booklet that I was reading about her her life and her mission and everything. She said, there are five basic areas, and really when you, you sit down and you think about them, they're not privileges, they're human rights. And the first one would, well, she doesn't call it job, she calls it right, she calls it livelihood, all right? Decent quality education. Decent quality affordable housing and decent quality affordable health care and the fifth one is food and if you think about it <clears throat> every one of those areas we're all getting we're all feeling the squeeze you know and if you can because if you control any of those areas think about it you control an entire populace you control them you've got them you've got them by the you know what's mm -hmm. so it's it's pretty frightening to contemplate <clears throat> what's going on in this, not just the state, but this country, and, and in fairness, it isn't just, let's not make the U.S. the total bad guy in the world. It's going on globally and worldwide. It's just really frightening to contemplate. And I wonder what it's gonna take for people to, to the sheeple, a friend of mine calls them, there's the sleeple, to ri you know, wake up, <clears throat> rise up, and, and, and you know, get angry. Get, get mad, do something. Get off their collective well-padded butts and do something about it because the time is ticking down. I think of the hourglass in the Wizard of Oz, you know, where the, the wicked witch says, okay, you've got one hour or whatever it is, you know, and, and as the sands run down, she says, oh, when the sands run out, you're, that's gonna be your life, God forbid. But anyway. Just a follow up on that one, I was, I was thinking, uh, that's why it's very important to participate in these gatherings because I think whoever's watching out there, who knows, they might be encouraged to like start their own political party. And I really believe that we really need a third party. We really need a third party that's like grassroots, homegrown, from scratch, because that's what we really need, I think. That's one of the things that we really need to pull ourselves out of this thing because it's it's like one of the gentlemen said here it's like a vicious cycle and how do we break the vi that vicious cycle if everybody if a lot of people uh, support a third party maybe we'll be able to break that cycle and I'm hoping this kind of small gathering would like slowly grow you know out, out of Hoboken out of Hudson out of New Jersey the whole in entire America and then maybe a lot of people will say, yeah, what they're talking about on TV is right. That's exactly how I feel.
you know. Because we're real people, we're real people. You know, we're, we're, not, we're not like celebrities that they fashioned and, and they put on an image. Yeah. Whatever, we, whatever we say comes from our heart. Whatever we say, we think ourselves. And, and, and that's why I really believe that I'm hoping eventually one of the end results of this would be a third party because I think we really need a third party. Here, here, uh, <laughs> you know, um, of course I have hope, maybe I'm being utterly naive, that the Democratic Party will find their soul again and drive out the corporate uh, uh, monsters who have taken it over. Um, but I think a third party could force that, right? Um, there's a recent book by Stanley Aronowitz who's one of my heroes. Stanley Aronowitz is a, a, a political thinker on the left. He's a professor at the CUNY Graduate Center, uh, a great organizer who, by the way, trained Barbara Ehrenreich how to be an activist. I found that out recently. Um, and uh, who is Jane Fonda's uh, husband? Uh, Tom Hayden, he also trained Tom Hayden. And I said to him the last time I saw him, I said, Stanley, train me. I want, I want you to train me. Um, basically, Stanley talks about how there is no more left in the United States. It's no, it doesn't exist anymore. As an organized entity, it's kaput, okay? There was a left at one time in this country that got people in the streets, that had uh, organized press and got information out. It could mobilize people. And as a result, that's one reason the Democratic Party moved in a further left direction, because there was this tremendous pressure from the far left. My grandmother tells me stories about walking through Central Park in the 1930s and seeing socialists and communists gathered and making speeches on top of benches and things like that. And people like the Rockefellers, they noticed that too. And they got behind a man like Roosevelt so they wouldn't lose it all because we were going in that direction. And I think right now, there's this, because there's no resistance from the left, right, the, the capital can get away with whatever it wants. And labor is crushed, right? So if you want the Democratic Party to be Democrats again, like they were in the 1950s and 60s and 40s, and when LBJ was there and Truman was there, uh, even Nixon was further more liberal than the Democratic presidents we've had recently, you know. You will try to get the left strengthened again, build it up, and as a force in America and in American politics. And uh, yes. I think when it comes to the, to the Democratic Party nowadays, you'd have a better shot of getting a business like Macy's or Coca-Cola to go back to their grassroots. They're so, they're so firmly entrenched with, with corporate interests that there's no, I mean, there's no, it's a brand name at this point, and corporate interests know that they can fund d Democratic candidates and have their agendas advanced just as easily as they can with Republicans. Um, you know, there's, a, there's some difference. The media companies are big on, you know, on the Democrat side, but Wall Street, you know, Wall Street fund, funds the Democrats, they fund, you know, they funded Obama. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of, uh, of nepotism and cronyism when it comes to the Democratic Party. Um, go, going back to what you were saying with, with, with a third party, um, I think it's, uh, personally, I, I feel that it's, 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 me, it's, it's meaningless to vote for a Democrat or a Republican. I like the idea of voting to a th for a third party. When I, t when I tell people that, they say, well, go ahead and waste your vote. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, or it's a vicious circle, yeah? But, um, but it, seems, it seems that, um, that in order for people to, be, to, to riot on the streets, with things like the New Deal, um, whenever the government throws throws some crumbs from the table to the citizens, it's usually a Democrat. Um, it's to keep people from. They're afraid of people becoming too desperate, and and rioting on the streets, and rising up against the government. But what they realize is people don't do that until they're really desperate. The, the Revolutionary War it took a lot for us to actually separate from England. It took a lot of pushing and a lot you know a lot of pushing and shoving. Uh, for us to actually say, okay, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna rise up and we're gonna we're gonna break off from them, and in America today, people have, like you were talking about the Supreme Court decision, 
with, um, with, with the corporate media, all the advertising, and all the great products we can buy. We can buy so many great products that who, you know, who, who, who cares? Who has time? You know, these people, we, we, we work all day. People have their kids to take care of. The last thing they can even begin to think about, they know, in, they know deep down that they're being snookered. snookered. Thank you. Thank you. Much more genteel than what I was going to say. <laughs> but they don't know where it's coming from. I want to uh, move us along. I, I can't, it's amazing how rich the conversation gets as you have this type of dialogue. Um, and I do want to, we have some audience members here, and I want to make sure we have time at the end. Claudia, how much time? Are we Okay, good. Um, and also want to make sure we pay attention to art. And, and if anybody has any cultural offerings uh, for us uh, here today, that's also uh, very good. I want to mention one thing in the arts, a film called Avatar, which I haven't seen yet, but it's, I think it's miraculous that such a film exists and such a film was made that actually shows you the victims of imperialism rising up and fighting back. And I really believe that there's so much potential in terms of organizing around this film that it hasn't yet been tapped into. But I think this is an organization tool because I think we're all under this imperialist yoke right now in the United States. And uh, so I just wanted to offer that. And of course, songs like Imagine, you know, John Lennon, and still very much appropriate today. And OK. Um, it's just so wonderful, really, to, to sit here and listen to this organically evolving you know, genuine uh, dialogue that's that's uh, coming from people's truest natures, and it's not being filtered by any third entity. Um, and it really, I mean, it gets me really thinking about where are we, and what really matters, and what can be done about it, if if anything. <laughs> um, it's kind of I I don't feel that old. I am I'm going to be 55 in September. Uh, but it, it's interesting that I can, I can remember when television started. We were one of the first, I was five years old when we got our television in Baltimore, Maryland, and we were one of the first people on the block to actually get a TV. And I have a certain, I have a, uh, a pretty clear recollection of what it was like, um, I mean, as much as a five-year-old can have, of our, of our community, of, um, well, I mean, first of all, I mean, the, the sense of community is something that I don't think anyone can really imagine now. I mean, when television first came out, all you really had was each other. And, and the, the hometown feeling, the sense of connectedness with your neighbors was something that you really, it, it's impossible for a young person or I think anyone like maybe 10 years younger than me could probably even really understand. Um, and. Uh, I mean, a, an awful lot of analysis and a lot of it not really mainstream has gone into, you know, the changes that just television brought. We don't even talk about the changes that television has brought in society. Now we've gone on to the Internet, uh, which is a quantum leap, I think, into the virtual garbage heap <laughs> uh, from, from what television even was. Um, and, um, I mean, I, I want to try and get as, as much into my, my few minutes as I can. But to get a real perspective of where we are and how we got here, y you have to take such a, a long view. I mean, and it, uh, there was this book written by Oswald Spengler that was called Decline of the West that was the must-read book of the 20s. I mean, if you, listen, if you read Joseph Campbell if you, uh, or uh, Alan Watts or whatever, this was the book everybody was reading. And uh, there's this uh, legendary literary uh, critic named Northrop Fry. He said he kept it under his pillow at night. It was, uh, it was so important to him. Um, I'm just kind of, it's such a major work and it's so important that I'm doing some preliminary research before actually reading the book. But his general thesis is that societies operate in thousand year cycles, thousand years. Uh, from a golden age to an end of, to a period of total disillusion. And he says invariably, <laughs> uh, within two or three hundred years of the end of the cycle, democracy appears. He actually puts democracy as a, as a point of reference as far as when societies start falling apart. Um, I mean, it sounds very radical, it sounds very anti-American, but we're sitting here talking about how powerless we are now. 
Um, I mean, it would be nice to say that, you know, if the average person had the say and had a say in how things really move and, and how society evolves, then everything would be fine. We do have a democracy and things have fallen apart. Why is that? Why, did, why have the strong, why have the 1% and manage, and he says this is predictable, it happens at the end of every thousand year cycle. It's worth considering. Um, I, I, a lot of other things I'd like to say, but I, I just remember there was this wonderful film with Tim Robbins called Bob Roberts about 25 years ago and about this fellow running for office and Gore Vidal just played himself. <laughs> he made one of these rare appearances as himself. And I, I think a lot of people have heard this story, but, but he said, he told the story of the frog in the frying pan or the pot. Yes. He said, you know, if you put a, if you put a frog in a, in a frying pan that has hot water or whatever, or it's already hot, it'll just jump off. But if you put it in and gradually raise the heat, eventually it'll stay there and be fried to death. Um, and this is, of course, an analogy for where society has come. And interestingly, that, that wonderful spiritual lady 20 years later, used the same analogy, which was so interesting coming from someone who was so political and then someone who's spiritual. I think we're just completely fried at this point and we don't even know it. And, um, <laughs> and if there's going to be a political movement, I don't think it's going to be a third party. I think it's going to come from so far afield from politics and culture, it'll be, I, it's going to have to be a very pure, uh, non-self-interested movement where people, where society in general knows that these people are extremely sincere, it comes from the heart, and there's no ulterior motive for what they're doing. And I think that's the only thing people are going to respond to. And I don't know where that's going to come from, but I don't. It'll probably be one of the last things you see that's covered by the national media. <laughs> yeah, you know, I was sitting here thinking something you had said. You mentioned John Lennon, and you know what it is. I think uh, people, why they don't want to rise up, I think, because they're fearful. You know, because look what happened to, you know, look, let's, let's just get real here. And everybody knows about it. You know, if you're not in a cave, look, look what happened to JFK, his brother, RFK, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Medgar Evers, Malcolm X, John Lennon, <clears throat> you know, John Lennon, the government was after him for years. He was on the Nixon White House enemies list. They tried to deport his butt and he defeated them because he was a smart man. So they finally figured out the way to get him. But as a friend of mine said, you know, anybody who writes a song like with the lyrics like Imagine, working class hero, war is over if you want it, uh, he's a dead man. He's a sitting duck and it's just going to be a matter of time. And that is what happened to him. Um, oh, we can't because, oh, God forbid, we can't be having someone, you know, spreading out messages like that. That's, that's a... Uh, rousing that's uh, rousing the rabble so to speak you know but um people need to stop being afraid as what was it fdr said we have nothing to ha fear but fear itself yeah. so yeah. anyway uh, i think okay um there's a simple thing in sociology called maslow's <laughs> hierarchy of needs and when you're worried about your mortgage and you're worried about not having a job and you're worried about your spouse your significant others position is tenuous, and you have children to feed, s inciting a grassroots movement, or going to vote for a third party, H. Ross Perot again, look what that got us last time, gee, I don't know, I think I'll worry about my house in order first, and then start a revolution next. And then, as far as you said, sir, about products, we're not an evil empire because we have more toilet paper than the rest of the world. Okay, and if it took a thousand years to deteriorate, I tell my clients typically it's 50 years. We're on a 50 year cycle. Ever since post World War II, we've been going down. You talk, sir, about off offshoring, outsourcing. Rift is the new phrase. It's called reduction in workforce, um, downsizing, right sizing, re engineering. The truth of the matter is we, we've been in a holy war, not, you know, Judeo-Christian versus Muslim, it's the top 1% against the people who produce in this country. So until people have their jobs back, they could care less about voting for the socialist, Nazi, Green Party. The truth is there's two parties in this country. There's almost no difference between them. And my clients just want to know, Ethan, how can you help me get a job? So all this other stuff is very interesting, but I wonder at what point were the frog and what temperature the pot we're in is. Uh, 
Uh, I take a more pragmatic um, approach to the problem. Um, I think the reason, one of the reasons why young people who are unemployed, who are educated, are not rising up, many of them have gone back to live with their parents. They have a roof over their head, they've got food, they've got security, um, they're not happy about it. They're certainly not happy about it, and I think it's a tragedy to have young, educated people out of work. But there are so many safety nets that the government has set up, and it's not a good, necessarily a good thing to have all these safety nets because it robs you of that drive, the ambition, and the anger. Um, in this state alone, if they pay five or six hundred dollars a week in unemployment. You could work a few weeks and go on unemployment. I know people that do that. So you have these safety nets that the young people know about. I'm not saying they're happy about this, but they're not desperate. They're not desperate, they're not destitute. They have places to go and they go to Starbucks and they buy the lattes. And a lot of the times you don't know that they're unemployed until you speak to them. Um, they're not missing any meals. So I guess I'm more pragmatic. I don't think it's fear. I think it's the amount of safety nets and they're very sophisticated. I'm going to respectfully disagree with my friend Joe uh, that uh, there are um, really uh, a lot less jobs, real jobs in America, and the sense that people are out of work and oh, they're lazy, and if they would only, this is this is being promulgated by the right, you know, um, and in fact, since the great deindustrialization of our country over the past 30 years, there are less actual jobs here. Uh, and what we need to do is create some sort of work program. Uh, maybe it could be around the environment, it could be around green energy and uh, solar power and wind power, or, or reviving our infrastructure, or having a new New Deal. These kind of programs, because the jobs are not here. When the CEOs figured out that they could, you know, get around the union movement by outsourcing all the factories shut down. And so there are there really is you know, what are you gonna do? Work at McDonald's and this is all we have is these service jobs and there and so you I think in a humane society you can't structure it based on on work in terms of getting your, your needs met. Your you know, people need to eat, people need their basic need and the top one percent is getting their needs met. They're getting much more of their needs met than ever before and this is being done. This is being done uh, a really great book is uh, by Kim Phillips Fine uh, called Invisible Hands, The Businessmen's Crusade Against the New Deal. I've been telling people to read this book because it shows you how that top 1% plotted their comeback from Roosevelt's time over 30 years. They had think tanks. The DuPont family was behind it. The DuPonts, uh, th that, uh, they, they were there. And they were, they were you know, um, and they funded these think tanks and they put out a lot of books and pamphlets and work and Ronald Reagan used to read this stuff and, and, and eventually uh, the, the right had a comeback and now this is what we're living in this, this world, this corporatocracy of today. Um, again, now, before we're out of time, I want to have, uh, do we have time for uh, a song? We have 13 minutes left. Okay, that's great. Again, I always like to welcome works of art. Uh, if anybody has anything to offer creatively, culturally, that's also a part of the, the discussion. Um, but I think we're having a very rich discussion right now and a very uh, interesting dialogue. And, and uh, the fact is that we're saying things that were no normally not being said and those of us here are finding our voices, our public voices. That in itself is kind of a miracle, okay? And uh, so, yes. Joe, um, I, I do programs at about 35 colleges and universities. The future of our country, living with their parents, has already seen while they were in school what happens to their parents and their grandparents by being laid off. They also, when they go to those few service jobs, there are 20, 30, and 40 year olds in those jobs. And the other reality is these college students that I'm teaching today, because I also teach at CUNY and SUNY and other schools, they are starting businesses while they're in school with their classmates because they know that there's, they're, they're not ignorant. They know there's no safety net. They see what's happening to their parents and their grandparents. So they're starting businesses in school and it really is kind of impressive, but most of them are not um, delusional and they don't expect that there's anything for them and they certainly know that unemployment is not their path to a greater existence, so. Wow.
Um, at this point, I, I would like to open it up to questions from our studio audience gathered here in Hoboken, and even some New Yorkers may have come over all the way to Hoboken. Well, I, I think John's uh, referring to me as a New Yorker. It's a West Sider who came over especially because John's uh, of John's charm, right? And uh, there were a lot of interesting comments. Uh, I'd li like to make a few comments. Number one, those safety nets, you know, like Social Security. Before uh, Social Security started in 1935, 90% of Americans did not have pensions and were in poverty when they retired, okay? Uh, the other ones, the same reason why we have unemployment benefits and all that is to, uh, and the Obama administration recently reduced unemployment from 10 percent to 9.5. So I looked in how did they do that. What they did was they delayed passing the unemployment benefits for four weeks. What happened was close to a million people drop off the, the currently looking roles and fall into the discouraged worker. When, the, when, when they change from December to uh, January, what happens is this, the Bureau of Labor Statistics made a seasonal adjustment of, so that reduced it. So the reductions in unemployment that the Obama administration has made have simply been bookkeeping. But what would you expect? Because when Obama came in, what he did was he kept all of the Bush appointees. He has basically, he's basically Bush number three. And as far as voting for third parties, I say vote as a protest vote. I'm not going to vote for any incumbent, okay? But before you get extreme, I think that people did everything right. Remember the change, Obama.change? Remember all of the change that was going to happen? And then when he got in, he was so co-opted that he kept the same cabinet, the same people running the war, the same thing. So, you know, I, I say that we need to change, but we need to change at the top. And next time, what we need to do is we need to make certain that the guy who we elect names the cabinet because if he's going to keep the same old crowd then why elect him you know because if he's if he's not going to change anything then why elect him so i think the fatal the fatal flaw in people voting for someone is not demanding who are you actually going to put in charge he puts in charge uh, of the energy department a person who's a nuclear physicist who's going to push nuclear power he puts in charge of the war petraeus who since he's since he's been in charge for two weeks the casualty rate in afghanistan has done Doubled, okay, uh, he puts in charge a guy like Gaitner who stole his, his Social Security uh, tax money that the IMF gave him, and he said he's a thief, but I love him. So Obama still kept him, right? So the corruption starts at the top. I was looking at, you know, I was looking at the GDP numbers. And I said, what is the contribution of the GDP? What is the composition? Because the government supposedly has spent all this money on the stimulus, and what's the contribution? And I looked at all the growth in the GDP has been from personal investing. And what's the biggest asset that a person has is their home. Okay, so the de the growth and the decline of the individual in the United States is what's pushing, which, which is what's going to push the economy ahead, or what's going to decline it. Now I said, now what about the, all these mortgage refinancing programs? And I looked up mortgage foreclosure notices, and I noticed uh, of the mortgage foreclosures and workouts that I looked in a paper in Connecticut, and there were something like 48 notices. Okay. And all 48 notices avoided foreclosure. You know how? They were dollar buybacks. So what happened was, instead of the bank going through foreclosure, the full process, and then having to count it as a foreclosure, they said to the individual, for a dollar, you can buy it back. So that's how they're reducing the foreclosure numbers. What they're doing is they're telling people, abandon your investment, buy it back for a dollar, sell it back to, a, to the bank for a dollar, and then we can lower the foreclosure numbers and then claim that it's only a million foreclosures when it has to be a great deal more. Uh, one last thing. There is now over $800 billion, which is sitting in the TARP fund. And the TARP fund was to refinance mortgages. When Paulson and Congress put it through, it was for mortgages, not for Geithner to play with this program and play with that program. And yet, that money is sitting there, and what Geithner is, uh, the financial authority, now gives Geithner the authority to pick any corporation that he wants and to go and bankrupt it totally at taxpayers' expense. So we're going to, you know, the, the we're going to have recession two is probably going to start in a couple of months, and we're going to have, we're going from bad to worse. And I think we should definitely write to Congress and say we need change, <laughs> change in the in every economic program. Thanks for that speech. Um, 
We only have uh, a few minutes left. I always like to sort of close by if anybody has any final thoughts or reflections on this evening and on this gathering and what this is or what this might be. I sort of wonder um, if we are in a democracy. I guess that's where I'm left tonight. Um, I'm, and um, I, I, those, that's my parting comment. Okay. Um, yeah, a, a few things occurred to me when, when this g good gentleman was speaking. Phil. Uh, Phil. Bill. Bill. Yeah, Phil. Oh, he, he says Bill and he says Phil. All right. Bill. 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 Okay, Bill. Bill. <laughs> it's Bill. <laughs> it's Bill. I, that's, that's clear now. I'm out of time. But uh, essentially, I, I don't mean to be too cynical or whatever, but um, essentially hoping for change at the top requires votes at the bottom. And the votes at the bottom essentially is, are being manipulated by a corporate media and a two-party system that is essentially also completely corporate. Anyone who goes through the system now as far as running for office is going to be vetted by both. Actually, I mentioned last week, the big, big Brzezinski said literally that he had vetted Obama and he fit the mold of what they wanted in the White House. So these fellows are, are superlative performers. They'll tell you absolutely anything. They'll, they can create Obama mania and we think we're getting the real thing, but essentially we're just getting more of the same. So the thousand years is up. Okay, I just want to say in closing that I have a lot of hope just that the folks came here tonight and we said things out there and we started a dialogue and this is a new beginning and I do think we can make change. I think the cynicism is valid but I do think we should not be discouraged or disillusioned and we should stay hopeful and keep this conversation going forward and, and take it out there and if we can get this on the airwaves, if we can get this out as a national TV show and people across America can look and see that they can gather in their living rooms and in their cafes and, and they could have similar type dialogues, we can begin to mobilize the population. Um, and I, so I am, I am very inspired and hopeful that a group of citizens have come here tonight to Hoboken to say, and people who have never spoken on television, that to me is very, very hopeful and inspiring. This is the Public Voice Salon. Thank you for watching. Um, I think we are still in a democracy, but it's fading fast unless we act on it. And, and so those of you watching at home, email me jfbraden at hotmail.com. My name is John Braden. Again, that's jfbraden, B-R-E-D-I-N, at hotmail.com. If you'd like to be on the Public Voice Salon and come and be part of our discussion and dialogue or be in the audience, thank you for watching. And and uh, good night. <laughs>